Since its founding in 1907, more than 6,000 artists, women and men of exceptional talent, have come to live and work among the woodlands and fields of the McDowell Colony in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Edward and Marion McDowell created what's become the oldest artist colony in the United States, with the hope it would provide a nurturing and inspiring environment in which to produce enduring works of the imagination. To honor their vision and to help celebrate the colony's centennial year, four talented filmmakers, all McDowell Fellows, were invited to use their distinct angles of vision to capture the McDowell experience. The result is a suite of short films that explore the cycle of creation, the joys and the anxieties of making art at McDowell. Don't forget to send me a card. Promise? Yeah. Take plenty of warm socks. Uh huh. And you won't need a tie or anything like that. I know, I know. Now tell me if you need, like, you know, any advice? It's such a great season to go. Like the beginning of the school year. Hopeful, great weather, crispy, invigorating, harvesty. All that stuff. And don't forget the fall foliage. Yeah, yeah. Cornucopia for some. But isn't it also like the beginning of the end, too? Autumnal? A creative life in decline, preparation for dormancy, or worse? Not nearly as hopeful as the springtime, or the delirious summer. Even the dead of winter suggests the need for rebirth. Oh, that's just the half-empty glass talking now. Take a flashlight. And besides, you'll be surrounded by all those other terrifically creative people. Poets, musicians, other artists. The others. What? It's a wonderful mix. Totally random. You will dialogue. They could be smarter than me. Then you'll be challenged. Use your fancy words. Jargon is so useful in these situations. They could be dumber than me. Uh, that's dumber than I. Wasn't it Sartre who said hell is other people? Anyway, it's what happens in the studio that counts. Just think of it. No roar of the city, no traffic, no snippy baristas, no cell phone screamers on the sidewalk. No sidewalk. But what if I don't like my studio? It might be too, too well anything. It's a tabula rasa. But what about all those tombstones? Kind of intimidating, no? No, no, no. They're welcoming spirits. Just imagine, you're part of a great continuum of creative people who've been in that very space. And you'll add your name at the end. I don't even recognize most of the names. Were they productive, successful? Were they happy? You can always just turn them around, stack them in a corner, whatever. And if you're really disturbed by them, go for a walk in the brisk fall air. Remember? The foliage? Yeah, those leaves. Aren't they merely dead ornamentation? They don't really nourish the tree. They're just a shallow distraction from the real business of photosynthesis. You think too much. Just remember, it's a utopia. Great American tradition. A commune? Like Woodstock? Quieter. Walden? Better food. More comfortable. The Shakers? Secular, consensual abstinence. But still, a Potemkin village for cosseted artistes. Think intentional community, devoted to privacy, autonomy, work, stripped down, no distractions. But what if I miss all that stuff? What if I really need the city? 
you can think of your stay as a kind of self-imposed retreat where you'll, quote, gain the exile's significant advantage of enhancement through distance, isolating your homeland from the eroding clutter of ongoing experience. Russia for Nabokov, Ireland for Joyce, became luminous reconstructions, shimmering in every lost and recalled detail, unquote. Here's my worst fear. You're in the perfect studio, perfect atmosphere, no distractions, etc., etc. Then you sit down to work and nothing. You have a red alert, full-fledged creative block. Just go for a walk. Works like a charm. And if it's raining? Take an umbrella. What if I get lost? City boy in the forest. Great, you'll have an adventure. Like dropping by my neighbor's studio? Sure if you've been invited. Sort of drifting from my original intent when I came here. But, um, a lot of it has to do with this idea of disease um, with the skin that's kind of bypassing humans and going to inanimate objects like tables and furniture. It's just sort of this mutation that's... This though, it's not too bad. Like if you get it on, you just to wash it off. But knowing me, I would forget that it was on me. And... As I passed the library. I keep imagining a little guy with a monkey wrench trapped inside this vast machine stuck on a huge gear. Another troubling feature is that humongous boulder nestling against my studio, a glacial erratic that just plopped through the retreating melting ice sheet about 15,000 years ago. Robert Frost probably wrote about these giant god turds. Surely the carpenters who built the studio allowed a puckish whimsy to subvert their normally staid New England practicality. It just makes the house seem altogether too insubstantial, a kind of folly just waiting to be crushed by monumental tectonic forces. I'm not feeling too secure here. As I watch Cassie, I ask about spontaneity. She redefines it. In general, I'm trying to be as distracted as I can be so that things will come out sort of as directly as possible. Is it drawing or painting? I do um, occasionally have strokes if I fill in a large space, um, but more often than not, they're line. And that, that's sort of the linear quality and the fact that you can see the ground really is kind of what makes them reminiscent of drawing. And I would almost say they were like drawings if, I, if they weren't so much about the painting. So I sit quietly, trying not to make any more distractions. Nature's just fine in its place. I've come to relish the window view, even when it isn't really a classic view, just a frame around an arbitrary slice of forest, the rectangular border acting as a kind of civilizing agent of logic and convenience, warding off the wet wild, yet also beckoning me to give in to its hypnotic rhythm. Then I go for that walk in the woods.
Yeah, this is like I make a big paper ball out of lots of little pieces folded and joined together. And then I get caught up in the great diurnal rhythm of nature. Night is darker, day is brighter, rain is wetter, time is quicker. Space is spacier. Well, are you settling in? Yes, I've um, met someone. Want to talk about it? She's uh, someone who came here before. Uh-huh. A regular. Anyone I'd know? I doubt it. Well? She was here 50 years ago. I think she's watching. She's kind of guiding me. Violet Archer. Famous Canadian woman composer. Okay. But do you really think this is healthy? You know, for your work? Obsessing like this? Maybe she's my muse. No. Artists don't have muses anymore. Muses are too busy doing their own thing today. Maybe she sat right there composing. Listen, compose yourself. I'm all trial and error, trial and failure, so you know, I'll build something up and then completely have to redo it. Like this is the second uh, version of, of this. Like I have one exactly like it that's over there. And then I was like, oh, that's not working. It's all resonating wrong. And so I was like, oh, I'll attach that to the wall, and that part will be separate from the other part. You know, that's going to do it. Didn't make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> so now it should make sound, but it's going to resonate the wall, not the sculpture. Isn't that amazing? Work is 98% engineering. 5% philosophy and 38.2% emotion. We kind of performed being um, Australian tourists in a foreign place asking directions. And so that's what we're playing with. So we're having an actual search, but for something imaginary. Most people said, no, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, and then some people started saying, well, why don't you try looking it up on a map? Yeah. Everybody was nice. Like, no one was not, well, a few people were impatient, but most people were sort of either didn't know or sent us on this chase.
So, you ever been to New Hampshire before? No. Dinner's at 6.30. You'll meet the rest of the artists then. They call them tombstones. Every resident signs one when they leave. So, let us know if you need anything. Hmm? Oh, shoot, I forgot your name. Tom. Right. Um, oh, yeah, uh, where do we put recyclables? You got any now? I could take them for you. Oh, no, I just 
you know, in, in case. Well, we should get you some firewood. I didn't know the fireplace worked. Oh, well, it does. Want me to bring some by? Okay, I mean, if... No, I'll, I'll leave some outside for you. Okay. Thanks. Do you even know what a cult is? Because they liked my work. My books, Mom. <laughs> Hello? No, we don't have chores. Wait, that's my editor. I'll call you back. Hey, did you get the chapter? I'm not sure about that thing, but... Circumstances? What? But we already negotiated the advance. They've too many on their slate. They actually said that? Uh-huh. And mine was the one to go because... Right. Of course. How could it get more me? It's a memoir. I'm listening. I'm writing it down. Okay. Oh my goodness, I didn't think anyone was in here. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Olivia Miller, I, I, I live nearby. I used to work here and I... Here? Are you a writer? 
I was. I, I, I wanted to finish something. I started here. I thought maybe by being here, I, I would help me remember. But I'll go. Wait. So when were you here? Goodness. Years ago. 1959, 60. What happened? Why don't you tell me why those boxes are all out on the porch? Ladies first. Well, Cleo. Cleo, if you must know, I met a young man here. I was very young, absurdly urgent. I had grand ambitions for my writing. Love was something for the future, not now. He would write me the most wonderful stories, witty tales about these strange characters he'd meet around town. One night, I. I was particularly eager to, to read him a story I just finished, and out of the blue, he asked me to marry him. But I wasn't ready. I, I wanted to wait. He agreed. I see now I lost him then. He just took off? No. No, not really. But. Everything I loved about him, he slowly, almost imperceptibly, took away till he was unrecognizable. But ever since then, whenever I've tried to write, I, I, I have this horrible sense that something, someone is leaving. I stopped writing. I'm not leaving. Afternoon. Tom, wait. Uh, do you remember a writer here named Olivia Miller? I think she lived nearby. She worked here as a housekeeper. A housekeeper? Like a maid? I thought she was a writer, but I, I can't find her name. She was a writer. Very determined woman. I heard she recently moved into that home up the street. 
So? Did you ever look her up? I did. A few months ago. She didn't know who I was. An impulse as generous as it is perhaps natural has put his name forward, especially since the lamentable collapse of his mental powers three years ago, as the greatest of all American composers, the first to give American music a standing in the world of art. Indeed, as almost the only American musician who has achieved anything of permanent value. All lovers of music in America will turn their thoughts to the end of a nobly ideal artistic career, ultimately cut short to the loss of a genius richly endowed and of a sort and a rarity that this country can ill spare. The New York Times, obituary, 1908. three-camera television, 1954. This is her story, the story of Mrs. Edward McDowell and the McDowell colony. It begins some 75 years ago in a little town in Germany where, in the usual garret, a penniless young composer is losing an argument. When two young people see as much of each other as you two, especially in spring, they generally want to get married will be the 20th century Schubert. Mm -hmm. I'll write the music and she'll play it, and the world will applaud us. Mary, and you will have to teach 10 to 12 hours a day just to support your own. Give her up. I won't give her up. Mr. McDowell plays his own works with a power that holds his listeners in an iron grip. He might be called the stormy petrol of music. So strenuous is his action, so fierce the tempest of his musical passion, so rugged and storm swept the territory of his ideals. L.A. Times, 1902. 
I would recognize a new piece of McDowell's anywhere, as I would the face of a typical American girl in any part of Europe. It is unlike the music of any European master, and it has on every page the stamp of his individuality. Why can't a composer be given a salary, like a businessman or a carpenter? The work he does is just as important to people. But we are not concerned with the way things ought to be. We must adjust to things as they are. Oh, why? Now, that's the difference between Europe and America. In Europe, you say that's the way things are, we should adjust to them. In America, we say, well, they ought not to be that way, so let's change them. Goodbye, Mr. McDowell. No, I'll see you in a month. No, I'm afraid not. I thank you for your proposal, but I couldn't live with a man who might have been a great composer, but for me. Go home, but don't expect me to come groveling after you. I'll not permit my wife to support me on a broken down farm and a hand to mouth living while I write music nobody wants to hear and that's final. It was not until he arrived in America that the real work of his life began. With the admirable training received from his masters, he set to work at composition and teaching with but one aim, to make America the home of American music. Mr. McDowell was an American composer, but he was not a follower of the national movement in music, and he did not aim at writing American music. He did not seek recognition as an American composer, and indeed prevented it as far as his energetic protest could prevent it. Nationalism, he once said, is the common property of all the world, not the vital part of it. Music goes so quickly that ten years leave nationalism behind and out of the question. A good melody is always good. You said yourself that it was time we had a real composer heading the music department? Well, I was thinking of a European. I don't know any of these moderns. I play a little, of course, but just the classics. Well, if you play the piano at all, you certainly know McDowell's Indian Suite, and Woodland Sketches. Everybody plays them. Water Lily, to a Wild Rose. To a Wild Rose? You mean this, this, what's his name wrote that? Then you do know it. Well, my dear boy, I'm not illiterate. Everybody knows to a wild road. There's definitely a list influence, uh, something we call big hands music. A lot of pianists, they'll, uh, most all pianists can reach an octave, but a lot of uh, McDowell's music, even in something that's simple like uh, to wild rows, will ask for ninths and tenths to be played. A lot of pianists can't reach them, they would have to break them. That's something very typical of the list. McDowell, he's important because he was an American composer at a time when people still just thought of uh, music as coming from Europe. But, uh, you know, the, the two wild rows, one, one of the things that's so magical and wonderful about that, that it's, it's appealing not only is it approachable by an amateur pianist like me, but it's also very easy on the ear, very sort of charming and, and simple in its beauty. Send him a letter. Tell him that Columbia University has a place for him and that if he makes good, his worries are over. He can teach for the rest of his life. It was doubtless a mistake, in which I am sorry to say I encouraged him, to accept the Columbia professorship. Although he soon gathered large classes of devoted students about him, making music one of the most popular and prosperous of the university departments, Few of the students were sufficiently advanced to need the instruction of a man of genius. For seven years I have put all my energy and enthusiasm in the cause of art at Columbia, and now at last, recognizing the futility of my efforts, I have resigned the chair of music in order to resume my own related vocation. And they 
held their religious ceremonies on this side of the mountain, thinking it had remarkable power, energy to it. What tribe? The Abernaki people, most of whom headed north after contact with the British contact. And some people perceive Monadnock on the, on the east, uh, Brattleboro, Vermont, um, Amherst, Northampton as being an area of increased intellectual, spiritual, and uh, intellectual pursuits. Uh, Edward and Mary and McDowell bought a rundown abandoned farm, and Hillcrest was the center of that piece. They composed here for, for five years and uh, ran out of funding, and he applied and became the chairman of uh, Columbia University's uh, music department. And uh, they would come here summers. This feeling of peacefulness, of restedness, of spiritual renewal came over Edward, and he was able to do a year's work in, in two months' time. And as a birthday surprise to Edward, Marianne had this log cabin built. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, it's pegged and then it's uh, chinked with moss um, to keep the drafts out. There's this wonderful uh, cherry molding around the, around the doorway. Many of our ancestors were, were shorter people than we. So the door Edward, come here a minute. Well now who had the impudence to build a cabin on our property? I did. And here's your fireplace to give you plenty of heat. And I cut down two trees to let the light in. And look, here's your writing table. And in this drawer, there's fresh manuscript paper and pencil. Welcome to your very own studio, Edward. And happy birthday. His mind now destroyed. He would sit near a window, completely oblivious to his surroundings or his company, totally unaware of who he was. Did America's greatest composer foretell his impending madness? Washington Post, 1908. There must be something that you can do, uh, some treatment or an operation, something. McDowell believed that no country is greater than its art and had often spoken of using the property to establish a colony for a creative people. Always half starved and always alone. Despised while they're living honored when they're dead. Now, you mustn't worry about this. You mustn't worry about anything. Huh? He's got to worry about them. Somebody has to take care of them the way you took care of me. I'll take care of them. In the summer, I'll round up all the half-starved writers and artists and composers, and I'll bring them up here and watch over them and feed them and let them work. I'll be in the wings for all of them, Edward, just as I was for you. Edward. Edward. I was really a very good artist, she said yesterday, but I gave it up after I married McDowell. One was enough in the family, but 
To get money for the colony, I played all over the country and told of our work. This is a fortune to sink in a timber forest and a lot of farm machinery. Do you know quite what you're doing? Yes. I'm buying farm equipment to plant vegetables and fruit trees. I'm going to raise chickens and cows so that my artists won't starve to death here the way they do everywhere else in the world. I'm building an artist colony. That's what I'm doing. She was the first to admit that the colony was not always perfect, and she recounted her mistakes instead of listing her achievements. I'm nobody was her favorite saying. New York Times, 1956. So the cottages of the McDowell colony continue to house America's most promising young artists and give them a chance to create in a proper atmosphere of security and peace, books and plays and symphonies. Here, pleasantly domiciled in the lovely woods of New Hampshire, they're released for a month or two from the necessity of facing the humdrum responsibilities of the workaday world. It is now the privilege of the Hallmark Hall of Fame to bring you our distinguished guest for this afternoon with our constant companion, Miss Nina Maud Richardson. This is Edward McDowell. It amuses me a great deal and I think it does a great many people, that I should live to be nearly a hundred before I was on television. To be correct, I'll be 97, November 22nd. But I am so glad to be here. So thankful that this opportunity has been given to the whole country, which has helped so long and so hard to bring the colony, more or less, in safety. During his illness, she had taken to lifting him, putting a great strain on her tiny, hardly robust body. Her back was injured again, and once more she was on crutches. This did not stop her from trying to get money for the colony from J.P. Morgan, who offered to give her a pension for life, but not a cent for a damn fool scheme for indigent bohemians that would never work. Stressful day. I haven't even started. <laughs> so I want to schedule a pickup to Peterborough, New Hampshire. So when do you leave? Gotta, Gotta be there by. translate some of birds to replace those lost.
sang. The dead go to heaven without shame. Where the fools, the poor, the fools, and the foreigners live. I'm working on an opera called The Bonesetter's Daughter based on a novel by Amy Tan. And I'm very much in the middle of it now. You can't make me. You're not my mother. I'm basically as a composer self-taught. So McDowell gave me a sense of how to structure your work day and your life. And so the core of it is really solitary hard work. Why not kill yourself right I applied to McDowell and I found out that I'm pregnant. It's hard work lifting bags of cement. But as an artist, you get pregnant. You can't stop making work. You can't put that on hold for nine months. My dad's like, so you're going to summer camp? Your only responsibility is make work. kind of like a state of being. Everybody's sharing a state of being on this property, but they're all in their own little spots. It'd be hard to have this state of being like, although it's not impossible, at the Jersey Shore. You got something that's beautiful in itself, like a stick. A stick is like a beautifully drawn line by nature. There were no sticks in New York unless you wanted to risk a rest in Central Park. I had to get to the country to find sticks. And, thank God, there's a profusion of them. Each photograph here is from a poem from the Spoon River Anthology, eulogizing murderers and alcoholics. And so I'm glad that you volunteer to be in my pictures. Yeah. Your photograph is about wanting to pack up and leave. Oh man, that's why I'm gonna have to step into that. Oh, careful. <laughs> careful! This is sort of dangerous. If I can help you do anything. I'll be wet. This is good. I cannot believe I am this wet. <laughs> I'm okay. Uh, there's just so many little holes. Yeah. But this is very scary because there's so many rocks and they're all very slimy. Ah. What kind of look am I supposed to have on my face? A grim one? That one is really nice. Okay. Ah! This is so good. That is amazing. <laughs> okay, look right at the lens. Oh my god. One, two, three. Actually, stay just like that. Oh, yeah, like that. One, two, three. Great. Initially, Marion McDowell delivered the lunches in a little pony cart. I think around 1907, the staff started delivering the lunches. If an organization starts with a remarkable person like her, that energy has to continue forward. There are the short-term and the long-term romances called artistic collaborations in the trade. <laughs> Blake's a true lover of art. Hi. In India, when we enter the sacred space, they kick a little vessel of rice. And so then Blake got me a little vessel of rice. <laughs> Aaron Copeland says, you will never understand how much you've contributed to my work. Hey, Welcome doing? back home. I waited just to see you. It's good to see you back. So good to see you. Oh. Um, <laughs> see you, Laura.
Just don't tell anybody that it's fun. <laughs> Job security. <laughs> there goes my, that's the end of my work. <laughs> it's a fairy tale. This mysterious basket that arrives as if by magic. Also, you're in your studio all day. It's really the only thing that happens. <laughs> it's a tuna sandwich. Chocolate biscotti. I'm a fiction writer. I start the day around 9. I'm going to use at 6.30. That's nine hours. It's building that character, building that scene. So you have a lot of work. I like going back and forth between reality and fiction because it's kind of a representation of psychological states. I'm interested in uncertainty. This represents the peaks and valleys of my video piece of the action, also of the sound. So I'm playing around with psychological landscape. In this case, of the stealth bomber, I imagine this massive, like, black granite stealth fighter on the mall in Washington, and you would have a cafe here and a Disney-esque boat ride. Maybe you'd have the sound of crickets and a campsite with American soldiers cooking some ready-to-eat meals. So you could go through and kind of see the soldier's life. And I'd love to pitch it to Congress or something. We have to have a place where we can celebrate those acts of nationalism. The McDowell Colony in Peterborough, I don't really know how they mingle in with the town. I know that they use the facilities, you know, they come and shop. I've been getting out of the studio space into retail space. Instead of going to the art supply store, I seem to find myself in shopping centers. Telephone call on 126. A lot of the work I've been doing is casting everyday objects, notably within the domestic setting. Some of them take on an erotic aspect. These are dove bottles. This is really taking a manufactured object and then recasting it, taking any of the signage off of it and having the form itself. They're kind of sexual, but yet you think of Brian Cruz's Bird in Flight, kind of modernist aesthetic to it. I particularly identified with this dove bottle on that level. The yellow bird was up the road and took off quickly, though not so quickly as the swallow skimming the field. He's like a hum that always hums at the edge of where I am is blunt and soft. He blows on it. Harder for now. What wouldn't I give? Fake eye in your palm. The glistening almost twin of the living one. I hate it. A lichen stained boulder, a surge of poison sumac, the two birch saplings, thin and ductile. I said, I could be the first person. Things change when you play around with it. You know, we'll spend 20 minutes writing a line and then another 20 minutes deleting it. And then for a fraction of their worth. That's better, huh? <sighs> When I'm stuck, part of the process is walking around, eat an apple, a lot of starts and stops, but that's what's so great about having uninterrupted time, it allows for that.
the time-space continuum was just not operating in a linear fashion. He dressed up like a beautiful flamenco dancer and walked around the stage going, for two hours and it was the best thing I've ever seen. You get the freedom to be in a community where everybody understands what you're about. There have been Pulitzer Prize winners here, but nobody's talking about that because what is art except the striving towards your own truthfulness? I can distract myself with knitting in the studio the entire day. Like writing thank you notes is a major project. It's like this metaphor. Everyone is so dedicated to their work. So as much as I value my art, I value theirs. No, this field is not being used to grow soybeans. But what's happening here, you can't quantify that in money. Walk into any museum and you look at work from the time of the Greeks, that culture is gone. What's left? Not the soybeans. What's left is the art. How does a culture value art? There might be something produced that will influence the culture for centuries to come. The value of it is almost incalculable, and all you've done is given someone two months to be quiet. Mm -hmm.